My name is Jeremy Corbell. I seek to weaponize your curiosity, and if you're ready to suspend your own prejudice, welcome to the world of extraordinary beliefs. Are we all the products of an alien video game? The extraterrestrial technology is real, it's possible. We have material that has been pulled out of a man's leg that should not exist. This sample could not have been made on Earth because the isotopic ratios. I know there are alien craft here from another planet, but I was inside one. Who are we? And where are we actually sitting within the architecture of our universe? Are we alone? Or is the answer simply stranger than we can think? We can think. We're going to cancel the uh, training exercise. Uh, we have real-world passing. I was the guy in charge of over 300 people at 12 airplanes. I do have first-hand account of something that I could not explain. This thing's been on over 100 broadcasts and over 300-plus publications. You know, I guess if a flying saucer landed in the middle of the mall in D.C. and the news people saw it where it became a reality like you see in movies, then it would instantly go away. But because that hasn't happened, and you know, I, I don't see it happening, then it, it takes time. I have talked to people in the government about this. There are people trying to figure out what are these things? Can we advance ourselves from the technology? Let's stop looking at these things like they're freakish, and let's try and learn from them, and then possibly reverse engineer or develop technology that gives us that capability. I'm sure you're not gonna believe this. That thing is in your cap again. This is part two of my interview with Commander David Fravor. If you haven't listened to part one, go do that now. You need to understand who Commander Fravor is and the nature and importance of his UFO encounter. In this discussion, we get into the details. We talk about the different witness reports on the Tic Tac UFO encounter and talk about the nature of observation and how it can be flawed. This highlights the important role of a good investigator and how event witnesses can't be compared as apples to apples. Commander Fravor even relates a couple stories that provide deeper meaning into the feelings he has on why intelligent observation and study in the UFO topic is important. Dave's quite candid in this interview. His hope is that you understand the importance of serious UFO encounters being seriously investigated that there's so much to gain, but also so much to lose if we don't openly investigate observed UFO technologies, that he's hopeful due to renewed government interest. I wanted to continue the interview so it's on the record. I think some things should be cleared up. What you have to say is important, especially when it starts getting distorted. So I wanna ask you a few questions and I wanna see if you can put these things to bed that pilot report that's touted out there as being legitimate. They're quoting somebody that they're calling source and everybody else is called other knowledgeable one, other knowledgeable two, okay one, okay two. In that document, whoever source is, which I've figured out who it is and it's obviously not you, you're okay two in that document. Source is saying that the radio controller was a female and you clarified that for me on our last talk. No, it was a male. And the 13-page report that came out, the controller's name is Poison, and that's a man named So I believe that to be correct in the 13-page report compared to the one on TTSA. But you got to remember that the, the one on TTSA, you know, one, it's years after the fact. Two, the person is experience level was significantly lower. They were relatively new. So there's a lot that goes into that. Don't create everyone in the scenarios as apples and apples. I mean, there's anywhere from brand new on the ship to someone like myself who's been out there for 16 years and it's my fifth deployment. It's not apples to apples. You are the commander of your squadron. It's not just that. I was just fortunate enough to never, I never left the cockpit. So I was either deployed or I was teaching. So I didn't go do a short tour. I wasn't in a jet for three years or whatever. I, I was current from the day I started flight school until I retired, which is really, you can't even do it anymore. You're not even allowed to do it anymore. Aviation is a very perishable skill. When I say that, I mean recall is a perishable skill. 
understanding, you know, when you're out over the water and you don't have visual references, what's north, what's south, what's east, what's west, and the ability to, to pull all that back, you don't just get it yet tomorrow. You can't read a book and get it. It's literally a repetitive practice, constantly doing it. That's very important when we start talking about this. In the TTSA website document of the pilot report, source is the other person who's flying the plane. You both have WSOs, but it's the other person flying the plane when there's two planes to go engage the Tic Tac. So that person named source was the other pilot that day. And that pilot you're saying didn't have as much experience as say yourself. Oh, not even close. That person, you know, is literally at opposite ends of the spectrum as far as experience. The other pilot knows that. I talk to them quite often. The other thing that was in that document, and it's something that you and I talked about before that document was released, before the New York Times, before anything. And you told me a story. And that story was that after you engaged the Tic Tac, you came back into the ready room. The person we're calling Source started writing on printer paper and mailed a report to their aunt that said, keep this because it's important stuff about some real X-Files shit. Is that correct? That is actually a true statement. The other part of that story that we had talked about, it was said that you made an electronic copy of the gun tape from your F-18. No, when the other guys, when they came back with the video, I copied those tapes and I put them in the safe. Where they ever ended up, I do not know. I do not possess them. They were, they were actually in a safe for safekeeping. The problem is they obviously, I think someone found them because they weren't marked on. It just had a piece of yellow paper on it that said 4CO. So whatever happened to them after that, I don't know. Is that normal protocol to create copies of the tapes? And- it's not uncommon to copy things. And as the CEO, I, I actually have that ability to go, we're copying this and we'll just keep it in the safe, which is what happened. It was all handled correctly. But yeah, hell yeah, I copied them. The tapes are actually classified. So you just can't pull video off, which happened anyway, which I mean, obviously there's, that's a whole nother story that we're not going to get into. Cause you can copy stuff and then you can declassify it by getting rid of a lot of the markings, but it's kind of a moot point because it's already out there. Just to make the story real clear, because it's, it's confusing in that report on the TTSA website, the, the guy's source said that you began making an electronic copy immediately after getting back of a gun tape of the F-18. So it makes it sound like... The only footage on video was the footage from the plane that took the, that you see on YouTube. We don't take the HUD camera unless we're doing certain missions. There was nothing on ours because we didn't radar lock and we didn't grab with the targeting gun. That is a true statement, and that report on the TTSA website by source is incorrect. Yeah. There are some known discrepancies that are out there, you know, and some of that is because it was significantly past the event. You know, and if someone hits you cold and you're not thinking about it, and then they start taking notes on what you're saying, you know, I guess the reason it's so clear for me is I always thought it was funny, and like all my friends knew about this, and the story hasn't changed. There's nothing to change. It is what it is. I'm not trying to elaborate or make it more interesting or the fish didn't get bigger. I just wanted, you know, to clear all that up. You'd be amazed that even even a misconception on board of what people thought, you know, years after what we were told or what we were allowed to do or people people will put stuff in their mind and and they'll believe that over time. Now, I don't think most of the mistakes of the discrepancies are intentional at all. I just think it's, you know, how the mind remembers and it is what it is. There was a New York Magazine article. It was very unfavorable and it was also basing some of its article off of that TTSA document where Source is talking, where there are inaccuracies we already know about. In that article, the writer said, it seems that To the Stars is trying to shroud Fravor's account in a spooky fog of faux top secrecy. This is a dicey strategy giving Fravor's prominence in online UFO circles. They're assuming in that article that you were the person's source, that you were inexperienced. Now we know that's not true. So the New York Magazine article, when it said, given Fravor's prominence in online UFO circles, 
Have you ever been involved with online UFO circles, Dave? I have not been involved in any. You know, it could be people talking about me. The other thing I want to throw out is, you know, To The Stars is not trying to do anything like that. They took some reports that they had gathered. There are some inaccuracies, but they are accounts. I was an aircraft uh, mishap investigator. You know, so if your plane crashed, I was trained to do that. And the first thing you learn is, you know, you get the eyewitness. They give you their account. Now, their account is not always real accurate, but it's their account. And what you need to do is you need to take all of them and then get the whole picture before you take one person's story, because there's always inaccuracies. You know, so someone would say, I saw it, and I heard a bang, and then I looked up. But what you really did is, well, they really didn't see it. They heard a bang. And the next thing you know, they saw it crash. Where they saw it doing something, and they thought it was out of control, but it really wasn't out of control. The guy was just practicing spins. And it was something else that caused the accident. He over g the pullout and broke a spar. And I'm, I'm just throwing these things out there. There's a lot of things that happen. You, you know, the eye is not always 100%. You know, you can be deceived. But you build the picture in your mind, and after time, the stories will start to change, or you just forget some of the details. It's not intentional, and just because it says source doesn't mean it's me, because it's not. I totally respect what Tom DeLong and his group are doing. He's put together an incredible group of people. Uh, Lou is part of that. Lou has heard the stories. Lou's talked to everybody. He knows, but they, it's, it is what it is, because it's a person's account they put it up So I'm just trying to shine a light on that a prominent publication like New York Magazine can have all their facts wrong and then make statements about you, such as that you have a prominence in online UFO circles. When I know for a fact from talking with you, you're not involved in any of this. You never have been involved in any of this. And I think it's important to to show that against a magazine like New York Magazine that people respect, where they get stuff completely wrong and insert absolutely fabricated statements such as the one I just read you. This is a perfect example why the military, we try and stay away from the press. You know, you get the partial truth, you get one side of the story instead of unbiased reporting. Even if you don't like what the report is, report it. You know, the news used to be that way, but it's not. I told you that at the beginning that if this goes big, people are going to try to distort it. And now we're seeing it. Physicist Eric Davis, who is physicist for OSAP and Bass, he came on coast to coast and Eric said there was testimony being given to government individuals to try to reinvigorate the funding for programs such as ATIP, OSAP, Bass. Are you hopeful for that process that we're going to begin studying this again? Yeah, yeah, I actually am. You know, I guess if a flying saucer landed in the middle of the mall in dc and the news people saw it where it became a reality like you'd see in movies then it would instantly go away but because that hasn't happened and you know i'm i don't see it happening then it, it takes time physicist eric davis he worked for osap and bass looking at all of this stuff he said there were actually hundreds of tic tac incidents east coast west coast but also other places in the world where he said there were tic tac style events so my question to you is are you aware of other pilots who have engaged tic tac style craft aavs anomalous aerospace vehicles or ufos are you aware that this is not an isolated event that there are other tic tac events that the united states government was aware of well, I've heard of other events, and I, I don't know if they were actually the Tic Tacs. I mean, you can see in one of the videos that was released, it's obviously not a Tic Tac. The gimbal you're talking about. Yeah, the gimbal video. You know, so I don't know. I think what's unique about my incident in 2004, our incident, because there was four of us, is that we physically went after it. I, I went after the thing. And it was reacting with me. Based on that, and I know when I talked to Lou, you know, he said that was the that was the most unique thing. You know, they have other sightings, they have other sensors that are tracking these things. No one else has really chased or engaged with it like me that I know of. I mean, I have a very limited scope in the big picture. Unlike some, I don't consider myself to be an expert, although I do have firsthand account of something that I could not explain after thousands and thousands of hours of flying fighters. 
You did tell me somebody that you spoke with that was a helicopter pilot, and there was an event. This happened in the 90s. They were picking up BQMs. BQM is a flying drone that we use for training. Can you tell me that story? I think that's important because it, it relates to this phenomenon. He was picking up BQMs and torpedoes when they test rounds. The BQM either has a parachute deployed as a flying drone. They're painted bright orange. Ship radars can track. They can do all kinds of training with them. When they're done, a parachute deploys and it lands in the water. They float. And then you got to go pick them up. Same thing with a torpedo. If it's a telemetry round, they'll shoot it. When it's all done, it blows ballast and it floats as a locator and you go find it. He had went out. I think it was off Puerto Rico. He saw this object coming up when they were picking one up. Came up from below. It was big. So they were doing it again. They were going to pick some of them. They were getting ready to put the diver in the water. He was on the lift going down. And then right after that, the thing was coming up again. So they pulled the diver up. The torpedo or the BQM is sitting there. And it just gets sucked down and the object goes down and disappears. So there was a USO, unidentified submerged object that was bigger than a submarine. When they were trying to retrieve, this thing pulled it under the water and took it. It just gets sucked down. You know, things just don't sink rapidly either. Just get boop, and they're gone. You know, these things blow ballast, so they don't just go away. You know, they float. So something, something pulled it down. Okay, so to be clear, we're talking about a buddy of yours who is a helicopter pilot who relayed a story about how a USO took this object down under the water that's made to float, not to be retrieved again. Is that correct? That's correct. It, it happened to him twice. Twice? Yeah, the first time when he saw it, they got their drone up. And the second time was when he pulled the diver out of the water and the thing just got sucked down and disappeared. Different locations, different drones, different days? Same location, different drones, different days. I mean, that shows us that there's just a lot going on that's just not talked about. You report stuff, and if people don't do anything, it never comes out. There's tons of stuff out there. I would say there's a very low percentage of stuff that actually makes it to an official investigation or where anyone knows about it. As you said to me the other day, when you report something like this, it could be a career killer. So there's an aspect of it where you don't want to report it. Yes and no. I mean, I never had any negative effects career-wise. But then again, you never know because I retired. So I didn't. I guess I didn't stick around long enough to have them say I was nuts. But like all my friends who've known this for years, they don't, they don't look at me like I'm nuts. At least I don't think they look at me like I'm nuts. You are describing from a trained professional observer's position exactly what happened. And I think people are appreciative of that. One more thing that people have been saying who were part of what was going on those days as far as like radar operators, they, they, a number of them say that there were non-uniformed individuals who, who came onto the boat, maybe it was the next day, maybe it was the same day, and tried to get the tapes and that the tapes were not given to them. Do you know anything about this? That's total bullshit. So let me ask you this. Do you really think guys are going to come on board the USS Nimitz and try and get those tapes that I had, and I'm the squadron CO, so I'm one of the senior people on that boat, and they're only going to go to Petty Officer Jones and ask him for those tapes? People are actually going to buy off on that? You know, I'll raise the, the flag going, that's probably not happening. First, if anyone's coming out to the ship, the captain's going to be informed. And I know both the captains that were on there when I was on board. So I'm doubting that happened. And I was really good friends, well, not with that admiral, but the next admiral who was on there. So I would argue the fact, I don't think anyone came up. And no one ever came to me and asked for those tapes. There was a joke that there was people coming out. And when I figured out that they were doing this, thought it was cute, I went and got my tapes back and had a nice one-way conversation with them. But, you know, this is this is exactly how rumors start. And this is the whole thing when Helene wrote the New York Times article that covered my piece. I told her, do not mess up the facts because I'm tired of reading stuff that's messed up. As a matter of fact, I told Chris at Two the Stars when, when I first saw the press release and I watched it, you sent me the link and the data was wrong. And when I talked to them, I said, look, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. But there's some significant issues with what you said that is not true. And if we're going to tell the story, I want the story to come out the exact same way it's been told for the last 14 years. Because 
here's what's the problem. If you get conflicting facts, then people go, well, maybe there's some, there's some untruths. Yeah, they're trying to pull our leg. Ah, they're, they're, they're making stuff up. Nope, we're not making stuff up. This is the story. And if we sit down and tell it, everyone will agree that, yep, that's pretty much what happened. You know, but because someone made a mistake, it's not necessarily that. It's just a mistake. Thank you for clarifying that because a lot of people are running with that story, but it sounds like it was a story that was created as a joke on the ship. So all of a sudden there's suited dudes coming in trying to get the footage and being denied. So you actually took your tapes back, had a one-way conversation with somebody who was starting that rumor? Well, they were, they thought they would play a little joke. By that time, this is about day two. I was about done with the jokes. So what was the joke? Well, it was the joke of, though, someone's coming out, this is being investigated. So I went and got my tapes down in the intelligence center. Actually, I told the kid, you're either going to get them for me in about two minutes or I'm going to have my way in here and I'm going to find them myself, which means pulling drawers out of shit and throwing it. Um, he got them for me really fast. I told him, I said, if your boss has an issue, he can come and talk to me. But no one ever came and talked to me. It was never a big deal. I took them back to my red room, put them in the safe. They, they just thought it was funny. I didn't have a sense of humor for it at that point. I think you put that rumor to bed, the idea that there were people that were coming on the ship from an intelligence agency co trying to confiscate the tapes. However, it's kind of sad there wasn't an investigation at that time. It took until 2009 for there to be an intelligence investigation. The other information I got, Rear Admiral D.C. Curtis at the time, he really shelved the whole story that he could have passed it up command and he wanted to go on deployment and he didn't handle it the way other people would handle it. Or well, I will say that it could have been handled better. You know, I'm not going to speak for Rear Admiral Curtis. I don't really understand how he stymied the investigation like people have said to me. I, I don't understand that. He didn't stymie it. He just didn't fucking do anything with it. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you. So I flew night vision goggles, okay? You know, when you're a pilot, you got to grow up, but you don't have to grow up. Sometimes we can be a little bit childish because you're 30, 40 years old. And you're flying super cool jets. And even if you're 25, when I started flying the real jets, it's just fun and it's cool and it, it, it's a great job. So we would fly around. Well, I had an I had an MVG low qual. So we would fly around at 200 feet at night with no lights on because we'd be in the warning areas where we're allowed to do that. So we can technically fly around with no lights on. So we would. And then we'd see, you can see campfires you know, because people are below us camping, you can see campfires from way away because the goggles will pick up that light from way, way far away. So we would get going really fast and then we'd pull the power back to idle so we'd go zing it over the top of these campfires and then you just light the afterburners and pull up. And you'd leave them on for a minute and then turn them off. So think about you're sitting on the ground, you got a nice campfire, and it's a pretty starry night, and you don't hear anything. Then all of a sudden, there's a loud roar. There's fire above your eyes. You're like, oh, my God. And then the fire goes out, and there's nothing there. What is that? That's some Top Gun shit, Dave. That's hilarious. So when you do that, you know, we always think, oh, they're crazy. Well, maybe they're not crazy. And can you explain it? Now, if, if there was a real investigation, you would come back and say, well, these jets were flying in this area. They were doing low training. They don't, we don't do low training right now. Uh, at least they weren't. I don't know if they're doing it now or not because there's a huge safety factor to it. Flying into the ground is normally not good for your health. But if you investigated and it was all, we were doing everything right, which we were, they could track it and say, well, that was an air, there was an airplane in that area doing low training. And he was just messing with you. But if people never report it, then they're going to think for the rest of their life they saw something they can't explain. And if you're not an aviation person, you don't think that jets are flying around because they're normally not quiet. But if you pull a jet to idle and you've got a bunch of speed on it, it'll go for quite a while before it really goes too slow. And you just turn the burners on and do whatever you want and then turn them off and you still got a bunch of knots. You're good until you're out of the area. And then you just bring the motors back up and fly away. 
So your point is that when you're a trained observer, like you are, you had a job at one time which made you investigate things like crashes. So when you're a trained observer, you'd get to the bottom of it. But if you're not a trained observer, then you're not going to see all the, the moving parts of an observation. So your point is apples to apples. We can't compare all observers as the same. However, your observation of the event has been consistent, verified, and matches up with all details. Yeah, not all observers are the same. And if you're really going to do the investigation, which is kind of what Lou was doing, and it's what Blue Book did back in the 60s and 70s, you should go figure out, is there an explanation to this? Because that's our natural human instinct is we need, especially from a science standpoint, there's always an explanation. It's the ones that you can't explain. Those are the ones that you got to go, okay. And those are the cases that are documented and investigated. Think about it. So I was the CEO of a fighter squadron, and I chased this thing, one of the many that we had been tracking on and off for days. And there was never an investigation. So I would ask, what else is out there, you know, where that's an issue? Weaponize your curiosity and go to extraordinarybeliefs.com to learn more.